Tell us about the biggest surprises in the outcome of this particular survey, of this year's survey. Like, what were highlights for you where you were like, well, we did not see that coming. We did not expect that. The thing that I was both surprised and disappointed about, if I'm honest, was the still low percentage of chief executives of family businesses who were female. So it was still under 20%. And when I think that, you know, many of the family businesses that I talk to, the boards of those family businesses are still predominantly male. And therefore, I think a big challenge for the family business marketplace is to really embrace the diversity and inclusion agenda and take some you know, really positive steps to improve the representation of women on, on the boards. Uh, if, if I can um, build on that, this was also for me and for uh, the research team at Step Project Global Consortium, also a surprise and also a bit of disappointment, if I can use that word, because we were really expecting to get a higher threshold. And being still close to the 20%, it really signals that uh, there is a lot of work that needs to be done from both the research side, from both the practitioner side, but also probably policy making because the issue about so women still facing glass ceiling to get on the top position is across organizational types. But uh, what I can say from research, we are also expecting that uh, family firms for women could be some uh, uh, types of uh, privileged arenas because of the family relationship In reality, and I do some other research on that, it seems that in most of the cases, it's more like a golden cage than something that gives more freedom to those women. So this was a big disappointment, but there is one thing positive in it, because we have also many family business leaders, CEOs that belong, we see an increased percentage belonging to the millennial generations. And it is interesting to observe that in this cut of the data, we find more women leaders, more women CEOs. So this is an encouraging point. How can we maintain entrepreneurial orientation inside the family business? How can we sort of like continue being innovative across generations, which all of us naturally struggle with, that once we become multi-generational, of course, the, the founder spirit can also become a burden, can become a ghost as well for many of us. But how can we take the positive out of that and continue that culture? So the entrepreneur orientation is basically the strategic posture of a company, of an organization, and it's made of different things. Here we can start a three-hour discussion about what is EO and which are the main dimensions, but I'm just going to make a a short wrap-up. So usually it's made of uh, three main dimensions, which are the degree of innovativeness of the firm, the degree of uh, proactiveness, and the degree of risk-taking. So there's three different dimensions, the first one being the attitude of the firm to invest in uh, R&D, for example, or introduce new products in uh, the market or even entering new international market. Uh, Proactiveness is instead the attitude of the company in pursuing these types of, uh, let's say, objectives. And risk-taking is the degree of calculated risk that the firm is taking, which um, can be leveraged with certain amount of uh, returns for the company. There was a lot in what Andrea is saying, which, which I think... You know, there is a myth that family business is not innovative when, in fact, we see lots of evidence of family businesses reinventing themselves, you know, thinking about new products and new markets, especially coming out of the pandemic. And so many family businesses are actually transforming themselves at the moment. And one concrete way that I'm seeing it is that, you know, many family businesses over the last 10 or 15 years have underinvested in technology, but are now having to invest in technology and recognizing the value of good data to help them make good strategic decisions. And some of this has come out of the risks that they took during the pandemic. So, So there is so much that is happening to change the way family businesses perform Do you think that you can see a correlation between those families that have retained, I would say, a high entrepreneurial orientation 
and their ability to adopt new technology? Is that actually a connection, do you think, where these two things have actually, they're actually leveraging each other? Absolutely. I, you know, I think that one of the reasons that, you know, a lot of family businesses did well, you know, proved themselves resilient during the pandemic was because two things in particular were happening. We call it the kind of historic knowledge of the founding generation, you know, kind of, you know, we've been through crisis before, we know how to keep calm, let's not panic. So you had that happening. And and then you had the next generation who were more comfortable with technology and could see the value that, that technology was bringing. So you had this happy marriage taking place between the different generations, which allowed the business to stabilize, but then also, I think, look forward from a technological perspective. Talk to us about the generations involved, because I'm really interested in understanding whether there's a connection between how many different generations of the family are involved in the business day to day and decision making and say the degree of social emotional wealth or the you know, entrepreneurial orientation. Did you find anything out about that? Some of the filter questions we have is, of course, if, uh, for example, the family business is led by members belonging to the same generation or members of different generation. And we classify them as, uh, let's say, single generation led or multiple generation led. And this is a finding we already have in the previous uh, survey last year during COVID is that, and also here we have something interesting, is that when we have multiple generation family business that are led by a mix of leaders coming from different generations, those family businesses are usually more successful and they are usually also more entrepreneurial. So, so the, the degree of innovativeness, the degree of the proactiveness and risk-taking is higher, even if there are some changes. I do believe we can say, we can now safely claim that we live in a fairly unprecedented time of uncertainty, at least within this century, and that uncertainty is the only thing that we see ahead of ourselves. So doesn't the entrepreneurial orientation question become a mood question? Is it even something that can be considered as optional or the degree of which can be considered as optional? What do you encourage your, your clients to look at in respect to that? I'm very keen with our clients to continue the sort of R&D journey, you know, to, to think about how they create new products and new propositions in order to continue to evolve. And just give you one concrete example, you know, I, I have a number of family businesses um, that are in the construction sector. And the construction sector doesn't make huge margins. So they have to think about other ways when they can generate revenue with a higher margin. So many of them are saying, well, perhaps if we create some different technology that helps us design the building more effectively, we can create that intellectual property and we can sell it to other customers. And so it creates a different kind of revenue, which is more profitable for them. I think that's a good example of family businesses kind of, you know, reinventing themselves to some extent. Let's go back to the leadership question, because you mentioned the young people. We have to talk about the next generation because, you know, they are in line now to, to taking over millennials and Gen Zers. What kind of hard skills do you both think these young people need to bring to the table to become the leaders of the kinds of organizations that you know are going to thrive? So the kinds of organizations that combine social emotional wealth and entrepreneurial orientation almost in equal measure. What do you think are sort of the skill sets that we're looking for in our future leaders? Part of the answer, I think, is I see a big increase in family governance at the moment. You know, families saying perhaps one of the ways that we can mitigate risk is to create a family council or write a family constitution so that we can put some protections in, but not so much as to squash the EO because we want that to survive. And then I think there is a huge amount around training the individual. So, for example, in the UK, we are actually just about to launch a next generation program in the next couple of months, which we've built in conjunction with Cambridge University. And that's a way of preparing the generation with some of the skills and knowledge that they will need to be really effective leaders in the future. But I think there are lots of things like that that they can do to equip themselves 
with skills that make them more effective leaders. Some interesting things we also found in this year's survey, which was also a bit disappointing. And the disappointment was about, we were expecting more family businesses to have been already investing in family business governance, especially as a result of the pandemic. So absolutely, what Tom is saying, I think it's of uh, utmost importance in order to empower also next generation member to get into this game and especially to be acknowledged and also getting accountability. And then I think that um, connecting a bit to innovation, I've seen also different companies that especially as a result of of the pandemic and the challenges they had, they realized that uh, the ideas coming from the new generation, the knowledge of uh, multi languages, the ability to organize meetings online. Now we do it easily. But uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was not an evident thing for every type of organization and especially some of the traditional family businesses. So um, probably I've seen some family businesses introducing specific types of uh, arenas in which uh, next generation members' ideas can get in, can get discussed, can get selected and then implemented. What's next? What's the next iteration of the survey? What are the questions you're going to be exploring based on this next year? What's going to happen next? There is a bit more than the report that it's out right now, because in addition to the global report, we have also several country benchmarking reports. So it means that if you, if there is someone from Colombia who is interested in uh, learning a bit more about what happens in Colombia in uh, relation to the other world regions, people can download this on both the KPMG uh, private enterprise website, also on our website. So this is the first step, which is already there. What we are going to do is that this year, this is still under discussion, but we had a very rich data set and there is more than what we have been publishing in the report. For example, there is something very interesting about technology, technological transformation, how family business deal with this type of technology. And this is something that we would like to explore a bit more in relation to different generational types of family firms in relation to, uh, for example, also different country characteristics. Tom, what's your biggest sort of like wish for a takeaway for family businesses when they read this report? Like what would you like family business owners to walk away with in terms of like, tools and advice, like what parts of the report would you love for them to really focus on in terms of what they can learn? So so I I think one of the great things about the report is that it does provide you with these four sort of examples of types of businesses and where they're performing or not performing. So I would like family businesses to challenge themselves as to where are they in, in those boxes and then look at the evidence in the report which makes suggestions about how they can move themselves from the underperforming family business to the highest performing family business, because it is achievable. And I think, you know, that's the message I'd like to leave people with, which is there are things that you can do to improve the leadership and the welfare of all the stakeholders in the business, which can really affect your overall performance. Mm -hmm.